Well, I'd like to welcome all of you to the DRK facilitated session that really seeks to explore perhaps one of the most pressing questions in the social impact space right now. How do I balance social impact and financial return at scale? My name is Rachel McCauley. I have the distinct pleasure of facilitating this panel with three social entrepreneurs who have built and continue to scale for-profit social enterprises in Africa. I currently serve as Africa Lead for Sourcing and Diligence for the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation. The DRK Foundation, a bit about us, is a global venture philanthropy firm really focused on finding, funding, and supporting early stage social impact organizations, solving some of the most complex global challenges of our time. Our support model provides both capital as well as deep operational support to our entrepreneurs over the course of three years, where we help them scale, build board capacity, fundraise, and reach their next growth milestone. DRK also recently opened an office here in Nairobi, along with my colleague, Kanini Wutuni, who's on the line, signifying our deep commitment to supporting proximate impact and leadership across the African continent. With that said, I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished panelists, all of whom are DRK entrepreneurs who have had incredible impact across Africa and really continue to demonstrate that you can be impact focused as a for-profit business on the continent. Our first panelist is Winnie Gitao. So Winnie is the co-founder of Kwangu Kwako Limited or KKL. KKL enhances the, dig the dignity and self-esteem of low-income families by designing, manufacturing, and delivering truly affordable and dignified and safe buildings in Kenya. KKL has provided 88 homes for 400 beneficiaries, 11 healthy classrooms for over 600 low-income students, and has added new jobs in their communities. They're also preparing for a Series A this year, so all of our funders and investors on the line, keep that in mind. We also have Martin Tato Stimela. Martin is the co-founder and CEO of Brastorn Enterprises in Botswana. Brastorn connects the unconnected across Africa, enabling rural villages to access the digital world without smartphones or data bundles. Brastorn provides digital access to more than 1 million users in Botswana, DRC, and is currently scaling to Cameroon, Guinea, and Cote d'Ivoire. 65% of their users are also female. Brastorn is also preparing for a Series A this, this year as they expand to Francophone Africa. So funders and investors, keep that in mind. We also have Diana Sierra. Diana is the co-founder and CEO of B-Girl Inc. in Mozambique. B-Girl works for a world where all girls can understand, manage, and love their bodies through menstrual education, premium products, and positive messaging for a stigma-free world. B-Girl has distributed over 300,000 premium sustainable menstrual products to over 100,000 people across 35 countries. B-Girl is launching commercially across Africa and they are building their brand currently across Kenya and Ghana. So I'd like to thank and welcome our panelists. And we will start by passing it over to you to share a bit more about your organizations and how you've managed the delicate balance of balancing social impact and financial returns at scale. Beginning with you, Winnie. Rachel, I don't think I've answered that question yet. We are still balancing. So as a social enterprise, um, we started in 2015. And one of the things we are looking at is affordable housing in Kenya, simply because there are more than 2 million people living in say Nairobi, with structures that are not exactly decent. They're made of iron sheets, bush poles, and they're not, they're actually living there simply because that is what they can afford. They, of course, they rent them at around $45 a day. And we find that in my country, people earning at least 30, 300, 300 US dollars kind of have an issue finding a decent house. So we were in a position whereby we were thinking we need a decent house. There are options available, but they're not exactly decent. And what is available is expensive. So we looked at it in such a way that we needed to come up with a product that speaks to the market, that requires a decent house, that is affordable, that is decent, that is sane, and most importantly, you feel safe and secure. So that is a particular price point that we're actually working with. At first, we started with thinking that we can actually provide a house of at a thousand dollars. Shock! It was not really possible because part of the material then there was um, other things like licensing. But it was, it was an important step for us to look at it in that way so that we can know where to position ourselves. Because in as much as you want to make a profit, 
you can make a profit when you have a beneficiary that you actually are targeting. So it is a balancing act of thinking. And as much as I want to make a business, I want to make a business, but at the same time, I want to create an impact. Whether it is in homes where we are at, and also whether it is in schools where we also serve that market. So it is still a balancing act even now, but it is fortunate because we have other investors that are actually willing to support us and give us this event. So it is still a work in progress, but it is something as a founder or a social impact investor has to have in mind, but especially a founder and people in business, because there are several things that make you want to uh, go for profit simply because you have staff members, you have to think about overhead, you have things like you want to expand, then you're thinking you need more materials. There will always be something that you think in the first thought process is, I need to, to increase the price of a product. That is the first thing that actually comes to mind because that is what produces revenue. But again, always go back to the vision. You are here because of an impact. What makes you wake up in the morning is the fact that you're providing for people who actually need those houses that are decent, that they don't have to wake up to somebody screaming because they lock their next door, somebody's house is burning or something like that. And the, all their possessions are going. It's something that you have to literally every time think about it when you're making a decision. You have to consciously make a decision knowing that this is something I'm looking for, this is where I am, and I'm earning value, not at the expense of money because that is not what you are there for. You're looking at possibly improving the quality of life of someone increasing the capital or maybe the, the expenses somebody is actually or the household income somebody is actually dealing with or you are improving the learning of a particular student therefore actually creating a foundation a better one for the for the future so it might not look like you're doing much in terms of monetary terms but in terms of humane or value addition to a human being it is a lot of fun and i am still absolutely. balancing it until now absolutely Thank you for that, Winnie. And to double down on something you said, you have to think about why are you waking up every morning? What is the vision and mission that drives you? Um, Martin, over to you. How have you managed to balance this delicate teeter-totter of social impact and financial return? And what have been some of the challenges that you faced in your scale journey? Oh, what do I say that's different to what Winnie has said? <laughs> It's always difficult following someone, but anyway, this is a conversation. So I'll try and piggyback on what she said and maybe add uh, or reinforce some of the points she said. Um, absolutely agree with Winnie. Everything she said is right. Um, what I will say is like, everyone knows this. I mean, you get into business for commercial reasons and the best form of sustainability is profitability. Um, you can't keep asking and running things for free. It's just not sustainable. It, you know, and, and you wouldn't do that as a business anyway. So in that regard, I think the two are already balanced. If you start a business, you know that I am doing this for, for commercial gain. It may be now, it may be later. Um, and then the second bit, I mean, if you are a for-profit. And then the second bit is you start a business because of a need. There is something you're looking to to achieve or to help, um, whether in the community, to someone's life, um, for government, whatever it is, there's an actual need. So that again is implied, the uh, social good or whatever. So the two, they sort of go hand in hand. I think the issue then is becomes about scale, um, which then defines are you in the impact space or are you just a commercially driven business? But there's always a need and you're doing things and there's profitability at the back of your mind. So the two are already merged in your thoughts anyways. I, I really just wanted to, to, to highlight that. Um, so, so that being said, we, we, we are quite fortunate because our, our, our mission is to connect the unconnected. So how do we do that in a way that allows us to do it um, and still be profitable? So we're profitable. Um, that's the first thing that we focused on. We didn't go out to investors and look for money. We thought if we have a business model and if this is going to work, then we have to do it, um, show that the business model works before we start going out to people and asking for them to invest our money. We have to believe it and we have to show that it works. 
Um, so we connect the unconnected and all we try to do is give access because everyone has the same sort of needs, um, whether they have or they don't have, they still have a need for access to information, to markets, um, to communities and whatever. And really, if you think of it from that way, um, whatever you do after that is like, okay, this is the need. I know this is a painkiller, meaning that everyone sort of needs this because they are in pain. Um, now, how can I give it in a sustainable way that allows uh, more people to access this? And that's why volume was such an important thing. Yeah. So, so I mean, I'll stop there just to give mm -hmm. everyone else an opportunity. But those that that's for us is what was important. Thank Excellent, you. Martin. Martin, I'd like to follow up on a couple of things that you said. One around proving the business model to ensure that you have a model that works in the market. And two, ensuring that there's a need that needs to be met. So when you are approaching different investors who sometimes may have different expectations of what impact looks like, how do you articulate impact to various stakeholders? So I was on mute. So speaking specifically on that example for um, investors, I think the idea is to speak directly or specifically to them understand what their needs are and get to see if there's an alignment with what you're doing. Um, otherwise, it just never works. You know, finding the right partner can be the one of the most expensive things you do in the long run, or it could be the cheapest thing you, you get um, because you've got the right partner. So you have to be very, very deliberate and very specific with who you find. So for example, we make it very clear when we get investors that, um, it may be expensive to do certain things, but that is part of our mission. That's what makes us feel good. That's the fuel that fires us every day um, to go out um, into market and actually execute. So we're looking for people like that, that understand that vision. Um, there have been those that have come and said, hey, this is quite profitable um, and would love to invest then, but your focus will be this, this, this. And we've said no. Um, purely because there was no alignment. So what I will say is when you talk to investors, the best thing to do is explain to them because the first thing that they are giving is money. And, you know, but other than money, what else can you give me? It's a partnership, right? And in money terms, you have to be able to articulate that for every dollar that you give us, this is how much it will impact our mission. So for, for, for us, we say for every dollar that you give us, this is how it will improve the livelihood of the people we're serving by increasing their incomes, by increasing their yields, um, and whatever it is, I mean, for whatever your organization might be. And then, hey, by the way, it will also give you a 10x return over time. Excellent. Very helpful. So once again, it's the impact, but also doing this impact makes big business sense and the two are not mutually exclusive. Deanna would love to kick it over to you. You have been at the forefront of building a menstrual hygiene product brand across the African continent. What has balancing financial returns and social impact looked like for you? Well, I think uh, what everybody here has been talking about is like the, uh, you know, like being able to identify that need that actually drives you as a professional, that drives your team, that drives a business. Um, in our case, sometimes, you know, when you're talking about a need that is also a taboo, it's a little bit complicated because you're working on a space that people don't want to talk about it. For example, in our case is menstruation. So for us, I think the whole key, and it has been a really long road, has been building evidence evidence that the why is it that is important that girls and women actually are able to move uh, and be in, you know, able to own their bodies when they have their periods, making sure that people understand that there is value on giving women and girls mobility for them to go to school, to go to the market, to participate in the economy. So I think, you know, sometimes that has been um, a little bit difficult uh, in terms to when we're talking about balancing the scale with impact, because when you're, building, when you're building evidence, the cost of building evidence is really expensive. And a lot of the cases goes on the backs of the entrepreneur. And that hinders our capacity to expand because before you even create, um, you know, generate demand for a market, you need to make sure that you educate everybody that is going to learn and you know, kind of like follow your work and understand what is the market, what is the need per se, 
And I think, you know, one of the biggest lessons I will say, like in, the, in terms of like the scaling is like, how do you also, you know, through this very uh, exhausting journey, how do you keep your team together? Because one of the biggest challenges that I have seen also in other peers and other enterprises is like, you can start with a very solid team, but like you are going to stand the heat of like not having too much, you know, like uh, resources and having to be very strategic where you want to put them. And I think in a way, you know, like the balancing act is making sure that, of course, like always investing on, on the impact side, but also always investing on the team that is actually carrying that mission forward. So um, we managed to have done this through, um, you know, like the people that works with in the company, um, they have also ownership of the company. I think that is a really good way to keep people incentivated. Um, and at the same time, you know, um, I just think that, you know, uh, social brands or like social impact brands and Martin can also speak to this, like is that secret sauce that, uh, you know, it, it just makes you wake up early. And even if you're like grind to the core, you still go and wear the t-shirt because you know that you're doing something that is meaningful. And I think that capacity to speak with the love and the passion that you have for what you do, even if you're just like, even if it's just like a tiny venture, you're just so convinced for it that I think that passion can really carry you over. So it's a combination, just to summarize, a combination of building impact, making sure that you keep your team and your troops always motivated, and you just keep aligned with the resources that you get, with the people that you have, with the, the, with, you know, with the focus that you're shooting. That actually, I think that is what is going to allow you to carry on further and being able to scale. Excellent point, Deanna. And I'd, and I'd love to double down on what you mentioned around teams and having the right folks around the table, especially as you're building a social impact brand. Would love to hear about some of the challenges and how the three of you have sought to solve the challenge of incentivizing your teams, making sure that they're aligned around the mission of impact and not just profitability, um, but also understand the longer term vision of scale. I would like just to take a little bit on the challenge and some a challenge that we had. And we, I mean, we had been around for almost 10 years in, sen in the sense of like, uh, you know, being this a, a, a personal project and all the stuff before we actually became a, a venture. And I think the biggest challenge for us was educating investors. And what we did about it was like going to pitch sessions, even if they were not, you know, menstrual products were not the hottest thing on the agenda, you just go and pitch. Because at some point you're going to educate somebody that had no clue that menstruation was an issue for a bunch of girls and, 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 and women. And then they happen to get educated in that session. It's like, get in front of people, make sure that you are loud, that you speak, that you become an advocate. You're not just an entrepreneur, you are an advocate. So like being able to throw you the shame through the window and just talk periods with like no shame or at least whatever that you're doing and making sure that you educate because we, at least in our work, we educate from the girl that is taking a workshop under a mango tree to the businessman who happens to get a Forbes um, a magazine on a, you know, flying first class. We need to educate at all levels. And I think that has been one of the most challenging, but also successful and like biggest opportunities that I have come across, uh, you know, leading this venture that is bigger. Okay, I think I'll take up from there. Uh, for me, I think one of the questions you also asked is about uh, impact as well as how to communicate them with investors and, and uh, stakeholders. One of the things we had to do was get the correct investors and get the correct people. Because housing is highly capital. Therefore, you find that it is not something simple and therefore the returns are not like immediate. So there are things like you have to decide whether it is quantity in terms of the number of houses or is it the people that are living in there, or is it the revenues that you get? So we have a mixture of people or investors that, depending on what works for them, it is important. Like the schools, the investors that are doing like the number of schools and the fact that we are improving education. There are people who like that. Then there are people who actually want to see the economic impact where the person is moving from say a low income housing or a very, uh, say, a very minimal housing to the person that is moving to our houses. So where are you moving her or he from point A? How much are they saving? How much are they earning more? Are they uh, improving their health? There are people who want those things. And getting back, like, I think it's Rachel, uh, not Rachel. Yeah, she said that 
it's actually involving because this is not if this is data these are interviews these are research things that it's not just the number the number of something this is actually economic you pin them into economics and things like that those are impact metrics that actually matter and when you're choosing a partner then you one needs to understand and speak so long as you're speaking the same language therefore there is an alignment if there's there's no alignment you're forever going to add your it is a marriage so you better decide whether it's going to work in the beginning or it is going to backfire so it is for me that is actually what it works in terms of uh retention or our talent retention or how to make it our talent the first and foremost for us it has always been aligning the values of the person we are actually um employing or we want to for our company because that is actually what is the most because if the person is attracted to the money, it is not going to actually last. Because this is something, a startup is a hard, it's hard as it is. The fact that it is there, it's just that it's, it, everything is a challenge. You actually do not need any more problems. What you need is people who can actually help you solve the problems. So how we do it is we source for people who are looking for a challenge in terms of, it is something like, it is ingrained. What are they solving? What do they want? Is it only money? If it is not money, maybe they want um, personal development or they want a challenge when it comes to design. Therefore, this is a person that can do in R&D. They do not like something that is just cut and paste. They want to think outside the box. So we find this is a person who, this is an engineering person. This is a person that actually will not feel disturbed when you're telling them uh, it is a panel. Therefore, it needs to be non-load bearing. It needs to have stuff in where Somebody needs to, it's somebody who thinks out of the box and is not going to be feeling like, oh, you're telling me to think. No. So when you're sourcing for us, it has always been important. Sometimes if it is a founder, for most companies, if it's a founder, some of them just leave, but it's important to retain them because they are the first people that actually started it. If you can do it in terms of you share something like the shares, you can share with them the company shares or a percentage of the profit. If it is a business development person, maybe you share with them something small like a percentage of the profit margin, you know, something like that. Also, some people, people like, yeah, so what they're looking for is not necessarily money, it's opportunities for growth. What is it as a company that can give them? It might not be you paying for them masters, but it's you directing them to different companies, you linking them up with people who can be their mentors, who can actually support them, or they can learn from this particular platform. So half the time mm -hmm. is getting, getting what it is that speaks to that person and can you add value to them because they're going to add to you. And if you're only taking and you're not giving, it's not going to work. Hmm. Winnie, I'd love to go back to something that you said around measuring impact for different stakeholders. So to remind the audience, KKL is a model whereby they are building modular homes for low-income families. And as Winnie mentioned, one impact metric could be number of homes built, the other impact metric could be how many people you are actually providing for. The other impact metric could be how much money are you actually saving your beneficiaries in the long run as it relates to um, affordable and safe housing. So we would just love to hear from you as it relates to articulating and measuring impact. When you have different ways of doing this, how do you decide what the best articulation or measurement is? Is this something that you and your co-founder do, or is this driven by what the needs are um, from, from the funding side? That's a good question, because I've, um, first of all, it's us as a business that we want to decide. This is what we want to measure. This is what speaks to us. When we are working, we want to know the number of, or first of all, it's okay. The number of houses is okay, because that's when we definitely decide how many people are going to be there. But what we want is just not the number. It's how many, how many families are we actually providing for? But we can only do that by saying maybe there will be 2.8 or 3. But we always realize that we are not the only people on the table. We have other people on the table. So when we sit around the table with investor one, investor two, investor three, all of them will come up with different things. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. So all of us have to sit around the table and say, for me, this is particularly what is important. What is it that will help you in that particular one? Then we'll, all of us are going to sit up and come up with, uh, shall we say, an agreeable way of working things that all of you actually get from the table with something. It's not one of us yeah. that is going to be the leader. 
but to make sure that the core of the business is always maintained. You are the one driving the business, not somebody else driving it. Otherwise, your mm -hmm. mission and vision is just going to be running away because somebody says to do so. Absolutely. All. Absolutely. Martin, would love to hear from you. One of the things that we've seen Brastar and Enterprises do successfully is partner with one of the major telcos um, in Africa. Now, going back to this idea of balancing social impact and financial return, here you've partnered with a clearly commercial entity. What was that experience like for you? And what was the conversation like when you said, you know, we have low income users that may not be paying as much, but what we can articulate to you is volume. Tell us a bit more about that experience and, and the telco partnership. Gosh, that was one of the most painful things I've ever had to do in my life, but the most rewarding for our business. Um, just to give you context, it took about four to just four and a half years before we signed a contract with, um, with um, Orange, which is the mobile um, network you're talking about. And that, that was not an easy process. So again, to give you context, mobile networks get a lot of value-added service providers shooting, um, you know, proposals. So they get tons of these, you know, so you really have to believe in your business and you really have to be consistent with the follow-up. I mean, but this goes to sort of every business that you do and any major partner that you see um, um, as part of, uh, for, of, the, of that. So for us, again, it was a really, really, I keep saying this because it was really painful um, and not generating any revenue for about four years. And then in the first month we generated, we generated um, enough revenue to cover off all our losses for the past four years within the first month. And that was important to us. But anyway, specifically to your question, um, how we did that was exactly speaking to that pain points, looking for a champion, and this works for any, any organization, always try and identify a champion, especially these large organizations, because that person will speak for you guys when you're not in the room. You can only speak to a marketing manager or someone, but then they have to sell that to some committee or to their bosses or whatever. So find out what that pain point is, um, and the first pain point for mobiles, mobile networks and large commercial things is it's really not about money because they already make money hand over fist. COVID just hit. Everyone needs to communicate. So it has to be more than money. I'm not just bringing money. We make money from just data and voice calls. So it was about that mission. Go find out what they want to do and who they want to target and explain to them how you'll be able to do that. So we were able to do that. And then we were able to also show them that this is something that you can try and it won't cost you a penny. We'll pay for everything. And then we'll just do a proof of concept. If it works, it works. Great, you've lost nothing, right? Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. Again, you've lost nothing. <laughs> Even with all of that, again, it was the consistency and finding that champion to actually drive it home till we tried it. And guess what? Like I said, the very day that we launched, they saw subscriber numbers. They saw things they didn't thought think um, would happen. Um, I mean, just to give you context, uh, Botswana only has, um, Orange has 1 million subscribers in Botswana. It's a small country. Um, but to give you context, the first day we had 50,000 people sign up. And then that just multiplied 250,000 and whatever, whatever. So then they saw that value in this. And then they were like, listen, we would love to go exclusive with you in Botswana. But we already expected that because Orange, like you said, is in other countries in Africa. The other mobile networks are not in so, so much, um, not, not in other countries. So it was a great partnership to scale into these countries that, that I'm mentioning. So study the pain points that these organizations have. It has to be more than money. Be willing to sacrifice a lot in the start to gain in the, in, in, in the future. So we're on a revenue share model. We told them no investment from your end, just connect us. And our the reason we did that is as a small company, you don't have marketing power or budget to go in and, 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 and market to a, to a million users by radio or whatever. But Orange already has those customers. So if they can advertise to that database and it costs them nothing because it's just an SMS to that database and SMSs are theirs, they don't cost them. But the value in the database that we got was immense. A lot to say 
Yeah, I know, but um, yeah, just understand them, find a champion, keep fighting, and, and, and show them that it doesn't cost them much. Excellent point around finding an anchor partnership and a champion within that institution that gets your vision and mission and leveraging that to facilitate scale, which is exactly what Brassthorn is doing to, to expand to Francophone Africa. Deanna, would love to hear from you on the point of marketing and finding champions. Again, menstrual hygiene products, not always the sexiest thing in the room. How have you managed to find anchor partnerships to facilitate scale for B-Girl? I think, you know, um, we have been going through a, an evolution in a way, you know, in a reinvention, not only of the business model, but the product itself. And I really would like to talk about that because when we started our business, we actually started with a menstrual pad, a washable menstrual pad, but we knew that it was actually very hard to sell, not only as the uh, user level, because sometimes, you know, people just didn't understand the concept. And that's why we kind of went into being a fashion company because it was easier for us to sell period panties than pads. And in whole that process, you know, like it's sometimes hard to communicate people that you're a social enterprise that happens to be a fashion brand. And, but you do need to make sure that you find those champions and organizations that understand what you're going for. So right now, as we're um, planning to expand, there's, um, there's a whole menstrual revolution that is happening right now in already in developed countries. And for example, period panties are like the growest uh, category right now in Europe and the US. So you need to make sure, for example, that you find the support of people like Kimberly Clark, Procter & Gamble, that even though they're kind of like competitors, they are not. And making sure that you create those partnerships, like we enter in an incubator uh, just last year called um, regarding WASH, the amount of information that we learned from Kimberly Clark in logistics have managed to really help us scale and like really be able to, to see ourselves in, in, a, in a more like, you know, business oriented matter. So that type of partnerships are critical. And as Martin was mentioning, like we need to make sure that you find people that is able to articulate when the, the things that you do when you're not in the room. And something that I wanted to mention regarding impact and measuring impact, I think um, for us has been extremely critical the way that we have put together our board, because sometimes, you know, when you are a social entrepreneur, you happen to land in this job by chance. So you are, you haven't been into a, um, <laughs> a, a very, you know, like you, you, you don't have this type of like MBA type of thing from, from Harvard or something like that to know all this type of things regarding like managing a business and reporting all those things, but you can actually put together a board that is really like that can allow you and help you to make sure that you can create that impact metrics that you need to convince and communicate to other people and find those champions that allow you to really scale the work. So I think, you know, when it comes to that, being able to, to communicate the value of what you do at different levels is critical. It's not the same thing to talk to a foundation as it is to a private investor, as it is to a, to, you know, like to somebody who just wants to put money on it because they see the benefit of the brand you need to make sure that you do understand, as Martin was saying, like, what are the pain points or, like, or what are the opportunities? What is it that they want to see? And then you just have the same impact, you just package it in different ways. Same as you do with your clients. Excellent, excellent. Would love to circle back to the point around teams. Um, and Deanna, you mentioned board. So one of the things that DRK provides to our entrepreneurs is board development. Um, it's something that's incredibly kind of valuable for the entrepreneurs as they continue to scale, but can sometimes be challenging as you sort, sort of pivot from being an early stage kind of friends and family board to one that's more strategic. So would love to hear from our panelists before we, we kick it over to the audience. Um, tell us about your board development journey. Should I take this one first and then the rest go? Um, I think, you know, um, I think it's like sometimes, at least at the beginning for me, since I have never been in a, you know, an entrepreneur or anything like that, you do not understand really the value of a board. You kind of have it because you need to have it, but you do not really understand the value and also the potential that it has. As, you know, and as we have been growing and as the company has been getting more investors and more people aligned with the mission that they want to contribute to shift and steer the company in the right direction, the more you actually understand that you know, sometimes you do have a vision, 
but you need a soundboard to make sure that you cross and 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 like and when you have an idea that you have someone to reflect to that also has the best interest of the company at in their heart so for us had been you know from being very um colloquial kind of like coffee type of you know meetings between three people to right now like seven and have a like very structured agenda having people to allow you and help you to put the kpis the strategy and for me personally as a as a co-founder and a and a, and a co-ceo it has been extremely important journey to really learn how to be a business person per se you know so i think you know one of the biggest benefits that i will say in this whole process is like being able to bring a balance board, having people from foundations, having people that comes from finance, having people that comes from commercial. And like, be, when, once you have those conversations, you can really, really, you know, leap your, the, the vision and the strategy of the company forward. I think like uh, Diana mentioned, really just uh, building um, a balance board is important. Um, what I will say to all the founders here is, you know, so I've had, I don't know if it's a privilege, but at least I've been on the other side where I've worked in corporate and I've sat in boards and in a bank, financial institution. So there it was very, very different. It was all corporate governance, you know, that's all the board came in. And it seemed like every time they came in, they came with a stick. Like, why this? Why that? You know, and you had to do all this updating. And yeah, I I really did not enjoy that at all, you know, and that was sort of how, you know, and it was really good, by the way, it was really good from a corporate governance um, point of view and heavily regulated industries, you know, but when you're a first time entrepreneur, like Diana mentioned, and I think also in, um, uh, in a very small startup, you have to, you have the privilege of picking your board, right? Um, and when you have that privilege of picking your board, you really have to define the structure and look at what your needs are and then look for people that can help plug the gaps within there. That are very experienced people that you will not be able to employ operationally to do that for you. So it could be a commercial person, it could be a legal person, um, it could be an investor, for example, um, you know, it could be someone with industry experience. So I'm actually literally telling you what, what we do. <laughs> so we yeah. look for an, someone with industry experience in the telcos, we look for an investor, we've got two, um, we've got uh, commercial and legal, and then business development. That's sort of our our five person type of board that we're looking for. I mean, we haven't plugged everything yet, but at least it was very deliberate in who we're going to get. I think that is really, really important for the founders in here, be very deliberate. Then if you can, I would, and this is where I do my marketing now, try as much as possible to apply for organizations such as DRK because they not only come in at a board level, but are very, very high touch. They kind of, you know, I meet with Kanini and DRK every sort of fortnight, and we talk about whatever issues we have, and they are able to address some of those concerns or at least lead us in the right direction. So be deliberate, find the right people, understand what your mandate is, and they have to fit into that mandate um, to help you drive your mission forward. Now, taking it down a little bit, also, because your question was really about, um, you know, also about uh, founders and your team as well. Again, it's about empathy. It's really understanding what do people want. One approach or yeah, you can't have just one approach for everyone. Understand your team, understand what they're about. What are their likes? I think Winnie mentioned something um, about how her team is quite young. Our team is young. Um, and you mentioned in our introduction how it's mainly female. It's deliberate. It's mainly female. So what they want is very, very different from just say, oh, we're going to do this. we we'll sit in with your board and say, we're going to incentivize them this way, that way. It doesn't work. Sit with them, understand, for example, it, just to give specific examples in our organization, um, before COVID, people were working remotely and we are just outcome based. We don't care where you are. We don't care what you're doing. Just bring back the results. Um, little things that we do is they work four days a week. They don't have to work five days a week. 
So on that fifth day, they still have to do work, but then we need to know how they are doing work that is personal development for them, whether they're running their own businesses or whatever, and we can provide advice in that, right? We bring in, because mental health is a huge thing um, for young people, sure. right? So we have a therapist, we have counselors. I think what I'm trying to go with this is really understand their needs. And then you find that they then see this, they see themselves in what you're trying to do. And if they don't, they will sure. go away quickly. This is yeah. not for us. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Winnie, checking in to see if your audio is okay. I know you wanted to chime in on the board development question, then would love to kick it over to comments in the chat. Okay. What I wanted to chip in and say is most of the time founders are tunnel vision. So it really helps to have a board of people or of people from different walks of life, like the others have shared, in which case they are more likely to tell you what you're not thinking about. What is it that you need to think about now that your thinking should not be on the table? So it's sort of like people that are going to tell you beforehand, oh, there's going to be a, a hole on the other end that you need to work on it now so that it doesn't hit you when you don't think about it. So there are people that will guide you, whether it is legally, whether it's marketing, whether it is whatever, because your board needs to be so, so vast. It doesn't need to be very many people. It can be a CEO or something, but people who are going to talk to your business people who are going to look after you, I, I can say, be on, on guard, as in people, they're sort of like guardians of sorts. You, I know people don't want to be answerable because you're used to having a small, I mean, it started when it was sort of like three or four people, so making decisions is just like pop, 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 and you don't want somebody else to tell you, hey, you can't, you can't do something above, I don't know what amount, because you need to have uh, three other people. Just efficiencies as well as making sure that you're answerable, that you're following all, you're crossing all the I's and, and T's. And also, this is not something that founders like, but this is something that you require or we require so that we can grow, that so that we can actually be a company of integrity and also attract people that are going to, because you're following policies, you're showing that you have needs, you are expanding, you're going to attract people who yep. want you to be the best that you are. So okay. they want you to have the best interest at hand for you. So it might be difficult, but it is important to actually work with people who understand you, understand the, your sector, understand your business. Therefore, they can actually put, have an input in it. That is what DRK have for us. That is what we have people like HRSC are for. They understand housing. They understand our customers. And they understand that we are founders and they have worked with founders before. Founders have their own ego sometimes, but half the time it we work well. Talk. Excellent point, Winnie. Yeah. Excellent point, especially around making sure that you are surrounding yourself in terms of board members with folks that can identify your blind spots because mm -hmm. founders can be a bit tunnel visioned, but also are strategically aligned with how you want to grow. So thank you for those comments. Um, would love to kick it over to activity in the chat. We have a brilliant comment from Esther from Convergence Blended Finance, um, who shared how they are defining um, blended finance, which is essentially the use of catalytic capital from public and philanthropic sources to increase private sector investment. It seems like this platform has really tried to ensure that all parties are kind of aligned on their unique objectives to kind of offset the burden of figuring it out on the founders themselves. So, Takeaway here, there, there are kind of blended finance solutions that do have a sustainability and impact lens that kind of align the investors for you so that as a founder, you don't have to kind of parse out what impact metrics, metrics ma matter here, how do I balance for this investor? So Esther, thank you for that additional resource. We also have a brilliant comment from Habway regarding structure, and I would love to hear from our panelists about this. So Habway asked or commented, my organization is a nonprofit, and I need to know how to come up with a sustainable plan that will help generate income and not just depend on donations. So for our panelists, all of which are either for-profit structured or hybrid, tell us how you decided to, to, to go with the structure that you identified, but also specifically to Havway's question, if she is structured as a nonprofit, how can she also make sure that she's balancing financial sustainability and social impact? Um, I would like to take this one first. I mean, like we actually, I mean, we are working around uh, access to menstrual protection, 
And we, from the get-go, decided to be a social venture, not a nonprofit, because what we wanted to do was to innovate in markets. So I think the most important thing is to understand what is it that you want to do or like how is it that you want to create impact? Because just to give you an example, based on our venture, you could easily be a nonprofit and you know, work on that arm, making sure that girls have access to menstrual protection in one way or, that, or the other. Or you can do it with the goal to create markets, to make sure that you break the stigma, that you use market mechanisms and all that stuff to really break through the, the market or, or pay the market and make it. So it's really difficult sometimes, um, and I'm talking from my experience, to have hybrid businesses because they actually, they both suck a lot of energy and a lot of resources from teams that usually are very small. So if you, if, if you think that, um, I mean, I don't know what type of business is this one, but like, if you think that what you're doing is a public good and the way that you can literally, you know, get support is through, you know, just selling the, 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 the impact because, you know, they, they should be important for somebody, I will strongly recommend you to stay as an NGO. But if you actually see that it's, you have a public impact that can also generate revenue because it has some income activities or has some transactions, for example, solar panels, um, cook stoves, like products, literally products or services, then just switch to being a, a for-profit. There's very few uh, countries, um, at least in, 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 in Africa and also Latino America that allow you to have hybrid ventures. It's really complicated. That, that type of structures, they exist in the US or in Europe, but it's really hard to pretend to be a hybrid in a market or, or a geography where the figure doesn't even exist because it hinders your capacity to actually get the resources that you need. I think I can take it from there. Uh, for us, we decided to be a for profit simply because for us, the assets that we, the assets that is more important is land. And in Kenya, land is owned by people. So unless you really, I don't know how to put it, there is really, there is really a very little room to work with something like I call a charity, unless you're working for the government, which owns land and they give houses for free. Unfortunately, that is not the case in my country. So we we don't have a, an occasion where the housing here is free. We are aware that there are people who live with as little as 200 let's say $20, $30 rental a month. And that is why they live in very small shacks. Simply because we don't have, nobody's giving free housing. So there's no way somebody can actually say, I am going to start a charity for housing. You need to buy land. You need to actually have enough money for you to be able to give away housing and other services. I am not saying it's not possible, but we are like, this is not something we can do at the moment. What we can do is start with the bare minimum that will offer not the poorest of the poor, but give them a hand or a leg up that they can improve from point A to point B if they slightly add into something. So you decide what it is that you can actually do based on the assets that you have, income that you have, or the people or the networks that will help you. If it is a charity, then you start from there. You have said you have an NGO, which is okay. It means you have a base, it means that you have your, your data, you have your market, that is okay. But if you need it to actually go into something like, shall we say, to earn revenue of sorts, then I think it needs to be another arm, but it needs to be registered different. Like you have an NGO, yes, but you have an arm that is actually for profit, but that one will have a significantly different name, different because it will mean that you have taxes in life, you're not going to be uh, getting freebies all the time. There are going to be policies that are going to govern it. So it is going to be a sure. totally different arm. That is my take on it. Absolutely. Great comments from Deanna and Winnie. And Havwe, just to chime in, sounds like a few things that are definitely required to consider is the regulatory environment. A lot of times that is the primary driver to help determine what kind of structure your organization should be. Secondly, what you're looking to do and accomplish, if it is a public good, if the partnerships are likely with public organizations, that's something else to, to consider. As far as financial sustainability goes, Winnie made a great, great point about earned revenue. What are some income generating activities that even as a nonprofit, you can start to create? Um, that could include, and DRK funds both nonprofits and for-profits. So we've worked very closely with nonprofits that also have earned revenue structures. 
Sometimes they see that some of their training um, um, techniques are in demand from other organizations. So they're able to do a fee for service for trainings, which then helps to kind of subsidize and pay for the rest of their, their operational costs. So to, to summarize there, consider the regulatory environment in which you're operating. Consider what it is that you're trying to accomplish long-term. Are you dealing with land? Are you dealing with assets? Are you selling products? Who are you partnering with in the long-term? And then think about what an earned um, revenue income generating activities could look like based on what you're already doing. Um, Rachel, can I just maybe just add one little thing there? Absolutely. I think I think Habwe it will be very difficult and would be doing you this just this to tell you what to do. Um, I'm just reading. You said I need to know how to come up with a sustainable plan. You know, um, that's that's a strategy session. I think that's one of the few things that you have to do. Taking account everything that everyone has said, that's part of the strategy. Once you do your strategy session, you'll include all that stuff from your pestle um, and understand what your strengths are internally, but also then you'll go in and understand the business model, but it's driven by what it is that you want to do and how you want to do it. And then after that, I think then you can talk to people to say, this is what I want to achieve. For example, we have all our different business model. These are the income generating um, things. And then someone can help you um, put that together, but it has to come from you. Absolutely. Great point, Martin. We have another question from Esther regarding reporting to our panelists. So Esther has shared that there are different kind of frameworks and metrics like 2x challenge, gin, gin impact tools, IFC. So the question here is, how do you treat each of these measurements? Do you treat each investor differently? And how challenging is it if you do as it relates to reporting? Um, I, I can tell you, like, at least from our side, I mean, we literally, we, we the only thing that you can, at, uh, at least on products and services that you can actually do is people reach either with products or with education. But there is like a lot of other like implied um, goodness that is, you know, kind of like immense from the, from, from the business that you have that you also need to take into consideration. But at the end, it's like for us, the, the, the easiest metric is amount of people rich with education or amount of people like that you have rich with products, numbers of workshops. And I think uh, in, the, in terms of, you know, being able to quantify this and package it differently, I mean, it's a huge challenge because not only it's, um, you know, everybody has their own kind of like, um, it's not that everybody has their own metrics, but like everybody has their own things that they want to be reporting on. So it's, it's, it's very complex. So we literally have, even though we know that, you know, there's miles of, uh, you know, like water that has been saved and amounts of uh, waste that is not going into the waste stream and all that stuff. At the end, the simpler the metrics, the easier it is to communicate with investors and also with, uh, you know, when you're doing your, your reporting. That's in my, in my, in my experience. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, it's re, yeah, it, there's two ways. There's two ways to do that. There is what you publicly say or what you have on your website or your brochures and whatever. And that has to be internal because you're trying to attract people um, that, are, that resonate with what you're doing, the work that you're doing. So you have to be very clear. Um, like I said earlier, for us, we talk about our impact and how, especially to investors, how one dollar invested in Browstone will drive this impact, you know. So we're very specific. We say, you know, um, it will drive the daily incomes of farmers from $2.50 to 3.5 or to 4.6. Um, and you have to do that work. And it's just there. It's a stat that says, okay, currently people are earning this much. But for our users on the Browstone platform, we've managed to double that income this way and we've got testimonials that's very powerful to drive someone in into that and again we talk about yield we do the same as well average yield in Botswana or average yield in Africa is this and but our specific users this is the average yield again and then you'll have a testimonial so that speaks to who you want and who you want to attract. But then again, if there's a specific person, a specific investor, you need to really study them. You need to know what is important to them. 
And then they usually have on their websites what they look to measure and then try and answer those specifically. Now with specific um, documentation to them in your teaser document, this is what we do because you know what they are looking to see. So you have to put in the work. <laughs> you have to put in the work. You have to understand who you're talking to. Um, you have an investor profile in your website that talks to those generic things, but the specific ones, you need to know what they want and address them specifically. Thanks. Excellent. We have another question from a panelist. How can startups working in sectors with long gestation for value realization, i.e. agroforestry, restoration, address issues of generating evidence, what kind of collaborations could help in such case? So I think the question here is sectors that have a longer timeline in terms of realizing value, um, how can they address issues of generating evidence to, to impact investors, for instance, if it isn't something that within two to three years that they can prove and what kinds of collaborations would, would be helpful? Uh, well, in my previous life before uh, turning CEO of B-Girl, I was an industrial designer and I worked a lot in uh, creating cook stoves and uh, designing solar home systems and these things. And you had something called carbon credits, which it really helped um, to, you know, fund and make sure that there were a lot of tracking on forestry. So what you could do is you can find similars. So you can say without you having to be the one who is going to wait 10 years to show that if you have a plot of this land, you're going to plant it with this type of trees and they're going to yield X amount of carbon credits or like what is the result? You can take sample, a sample projects and you are able to do kind of like a shadowing prize that you could do in that type of like really long-term uh, type of projects. Nothing to add. I think she said it um, spot on. I wouldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks. Excellent. Anything to add, Winnie? I, I don't have anything to add with the last question, but the other one for reporting, I think for us, we have, I think the first thing we did is we had a sit down with all our stakeholders, our stakeholders or investors, and all of them had uh, what they wanted us to report on. So for us, it, we already know what the metrics each of them want. So when we are submitting, uh, most of them would have um, a template that we fill in quarterly. So we fill in the template according to what they actually want to measure. And then for us as well, what we find that is interesting, we write, a, shall we say, a one pager of what we find that we want to share with them in addition to their metrics. So we just share with them, this is what has happened about the same something. So that's what we do. Excellent. Well, I think we can take this opportunity to start to do our wrap up. There were a few key themes that emerged during the course of this discussion, but I first want to thank our panelists for all of their insights as far as how it looks and what it takes to really balance social impact and financial returns. Um, and also thank our audience members for, for the key questions that they've posed. So a few themes that have emerged around articulating impact, one, Defining impact has to come from the entrepreneur. Articulating impact also has to be rooted in the entrepreneur's vision. Two, aligning the right investors. Articulating that the model works is key to aligning the right investors, but also ensuring that investors have realistic expectations of return um, is also of critical importance. We, we talked a bit about blended finance and making sure that all of the investors have, have their objectives covered, but um, Earlier in the, in the opening plenary of Sankalp, there was this idea of mainstream investing, which focuses really on returns and risk, and then impact investing that focuses on return, risk, and impact, or as we like to articulate, profit, people, and the planet. So as entrepreneurs are thinking about aligning the right investors, of critical importance is if investors are looking to have above market returns, for instance, that might signal that that might not make the most sense in the short term for, for a business that is um, market creating. So it might take a much longer timeline to switch this question earlier around um, sectors such as agroforestry. Another emerging theme that came up was around teams. Um, internally, how do you incentivize your teams? We talked about one, ensuring that team members as you recruit are vision aligned, um, incentivizing teams either with ownership or equity that makes sense for the business, but also ensuring that those team members are there for the long term. And three, ensuring that you as a social enterprise are also adding value um, to the team member as well, whether it's through professional development opportunities, um, the ability to give them ownership over certain growth strategies, 
The second piece about teams that emerge, boards. Ensuring that you are not selecting board members based on who can tell you that you're doing the right thing and that you're doing it well, but rather board members that are not afraid to tell you what your blind spots are and that are adding strategic value based on, on what your growth plan um, is. Same thing goes for founders. And then lastly, um, as we talked about impact um, and evidence evaluation, um, there are a lot of different frameworks that exist, but once again, sometimes it just makes sense to do strategy exercise, but it has to come from the founders themselves to determine how they want to essentially make an impact in this world. So once again, thank you all for joining this session. Thank you to our three panelists. And we look forward to staying in touch. All of our panelists can be reached um, directly through their emails. If the three of you want to drop your emails in the chat, that way folks can reach out to you individually for any follow-up. Other than that, thank you to the Sun Cult team and wishing you all a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, for the opportunity. Because as I said at the beginning of the call, every chance we get the, the opportunity to talk is people that you are educating and the topic that you're working. So thank you very much for extending you all and the Sun Cult team the, uh, the opportunity and, and the platform. Mm -hmm.